$500,000, The art world. Glamour. Wealth. Intrigue. 95, selling at $95 million. Beneath the surface, there's a darker place. A world of high stakes and gambles. International art dealer Philip Mould knows the risks. He hunts down sleepers, paintings that hide secrets. In the past, we looked at pictures. Now almost you can look through them. Paint almost acts like blood at a crime scene. I'm Fiona Bruce, and I've over 20 years' experience as a journalist. Every picture tells its own story, and it's up to us to try and uncover it. We're teaming up to investigate human dramas and mysterious tales locked in paint. It's a world of great beauty and ugly deceptions. How many fakes do you think are out there? Some law enforcement agencies suggest 40 or 50% of the art market could be crazy. Really half? In this episode, we go on the trail of a painting which hides the story of one of the greatest scandals the art world has ever seen. These are like your dirty little secrets, aren't they? Could it be by the most daring forger of modern times? We're not just dealing with an artistic mind, we're actually dealing with a sophisticated criminal mind. Controversially, it's part of the collection at one of our leading art establishments. After 50 years, they're about to find out whether their painting is genuine or fake. As an art dealer, Philip Mould operates in a world where paintings exchange hands for millions of pounds. One, put it down! But he has to be constantly on his guard. Fakes are one of the biggest problems in the art world. We're on our way to see a painting which has been foxing art specialists. The picture I'm going to take you to see now has caused real controversy. Opinion is divided amongst experts as to whether it's genuine or fake. And are there still a lot of fakes out there, even now? There are. I mean, I've been taken in, others have been taken in. But there was one faker in the 20th century who left all the other fakers standing. His name was Han van Meegeren. And believe it or not, he conned the art world out of about £65 million in modern money. Wow, so a very successful faker. And it's possible that the picture we're going to see now is by him. In the 1940s, Van Meegeren caused a scandal when it was discovered he'd swindled the art world with his forgeries of Dutch old masters. Among them, a series of paintings faking the work of Johan Vermeer. When he was caught, it emerged that the world's most prestigious art galleries and respected experts had been duped by Van Meegeren's fakes. During his trial in 1947, Van Meegeren confessed to forging seven old masters, but he didn't own up to all his work. 21 of his fakes have now been identified, and I suspect there are more lurking out there. So you think Van Meegeren is still causing trouble after all these years? Yes, and in one of the last places you'd expect. We're heading to the Courtauld Institute in London, a centre of excellence for the study of art. Here, the next generation of art world experts are trained. But hanging inside this highly respected establishment is a picture causing confusion and controversy. Recent press reports have raised awkward questions about the attribution of this work of art, which has hung in the Courtauld since 1960. Leading experts can't agree when it was painted and by whom. Dr. Aviva Bernstock is their head of conservation and teaches the scientific study of paintings. She's keen for us to help solve the mysteries surrounding the picture, which is causing such disagreement amongst the art establishment. So here it is. This is a painting that is riddled with mystery. 
I mean, it represents, I think, the procurus, it's called, doesn't it? Yes. There's a madam on the right handing over one of her girls to a rather lascivious-looking client in the middle, right? Is she the madam or is she the tart? She's the tart. Oh, I see. She's showing so who's the procurus? Is that a woman? This is a woman, yes, it's a woman, yeah. And she's pointing to her hand where she wants money. Oh, I see. Now, the question is, is this a genuine 17th century canvas, a work done in the studio of an artist called Dirk van der Buren? If it is, then it's an interesting picture in itself. Or, and this is where it gets exciting, could this be a work by the most notorious faker of the 20th century, Han van Meegren? What do you make of it? Well, it was given to the court hall in 1960, and it's hung here on the wall for the last 18 years, as far as I know. Uh, and experts really are undecided on the matter. It's gone back and forward between being a fake by Van Meegren or a genuine 17th century painting. So people keep changing their mind about it? Yes, the experts are divided. Everyone has a different view. I love the fact that it's here in the heart of the Institute of Excellence about art history and art conservation. You've been walking backwards and forwards past it all these years, and we still don't know. Do you think we can get to the bottom of it? Well, I think that what makes this project so exciting is that finally we will be able to get to the bottom of this and we will be able to find out together whether this is a fake or a genuine 17th century painting. And presumably if it is a 300-year-old painting, that will make it much more valuable than if it's a Han van Meegren done, you know, a few decades ago. Well, funnily enough, the reverse, actually. If it is by van Meegren, he's got a sort of cult following. There are people out there who'd want to buy it. Just any... 17th century artist copying the work of a great painter of the period does not necessarily mean people pay money. Right. But a name, a big name, a dark name, a like Van Meegren, name, absolutely. Yeah. What would you prefer of him? Would you prefer it to be by Van Meegren? I find that really odd. Here in the court, old of all places. <laughs> he certainly is a famous forger, and I think uh, to have a painting by a famous forger such as Van Meegren would be more exciting in some ways, as long as there's only one of them here at the court, old. I think you'd enjoy having one, wouldn't you? I just wonder if I'm ever going to understand your world, Philip. <laughs>
I guess what we need to do now is find out more about Van Meegeren, and to do that, we need to go to Holland. And I want to get really close to a Van Meegeren or two. I want to get so close that I can see the, the signature brushstrokes of the great faker at work. Our first stop, Amsterdam, scene of the crime. Van Meegeren managed to convince the world's most respected art galleries that his works were genuine. Among them, Holland's famous Rijksmuseum. It's home to the world's greatest collection of paintings from the golden age of Dutch art, including works by the artist Van Meegeren dared to forge, the 17th century master, Johan Vermeer. His paintings are among the most iconic and the most valuable in the world. Now this is the artist who inspired Van Meegeren in his ultimate crime, Johan Vermeer. What do you think of it? Wow, it's just beautiful, isn't it? It's very, it's very gentle, it's very intimate, it's stunning. It is so powerful, it's so introspective. It's also just what a kind of humble, Subject, humble setting, he's so domestic, mm. he's so ordinary, mm. he's so absolutely exquisite as well. Mm. You know, you don't have to be able to appreciate art, you don't have to know mm. anything about mm. art mm. to know that that is fantastic. I agree with you. I mean, the audacity of Van Meegeren thinking that he could, he could take on this painter. Now, just look at this. I mean, frankly, he could not have chosen higher goalposts. I mean, this is a variant of that picture. So what Van Meegeren has done is he's taken half of the picture and created a new composition. I can't believe that Van Meegeren thought he'd get away with it. You know, imitating Vermeer in the heart of the land mm. where Vermeer is most known about and most appreciated. But he did. But you see, that's where he's so damn clever. People really wanted more Vermeers more works by the great artist, the sort of Shakespeare, as it were, in paint of his time. I mean, there are only 35 works known at the period. But the other thing was, Van Meegeren had the skills of a magician. He had this whole panoply of tricks. In fact, there's some examples here of what he could do. The Rijksmuseum has its own chapter in this story of shame. Conservator Michel van der Laar takes us deep into the museum vaults where, hidden away from view, is a collection of paintings by Van Meegeren himself. My hope is that these forgeries might help us solve the mystery of the Courtauld's painting. On this rack is a painting which uh, for a long time used to be a big embarrassment for the Rijksmuseum, like an open wound, a painting painted by Han van Meegeren. Uh, and bought in 1943 as a genuine Vermeer. What did they pay for it? They pay for it uh, 1,168,000 Dutch guilders, which would be today something like 12 million pounds. Hard to believe that, that for such an ugly painting. That's an amount of money. Yeah. expensive yeah. That must have been a record at the time. Had, had, the, had, had the gallery paid it as much as that for anything else? It, it was uh, like a record amount of money at the, at the moment. Oh. But, uh, staggering. Yeah. But oh, it, that must hurt. Particularly yeah. when you look Every at it. Every time you get that painting out, that must amazing. hurt. Yeah. Is that uh, where it's got holes in it? The holes are made uh, in the court case of Van Meegeren to study and see if this indeed is a forgery or an original painting. But it seems to be done with anger and vengeance. Oh, so sort of yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, oh, obvious that it was a useless painting of no value. And what do you think well, of it? Well, I'm say, looking at it, I mean, I'm no expert. But it looks a bit rubbish. It does. It? I it mean, does. a bit rubbish. <laughs> yeah. But what happened I mean, is that it's uh, on the left. Yeah. But art historians of the time wondered: Aren't there more paintings by Vermeer? There must be a religious work, and uh, that's what uh, Han van Meegeren anticipated on by making these paintings. So he was trying to produce a sort of lost but primitive early work. Right. Yeah. which no one had anything to compare it with. Right. So yeah. he could just sort of dream up, in a sense, a whole new type of yeah. Vermeer. Yeah. Now, she looks familiar. Yeah, she? I was going to say, we're just looking <laughs> at her. This painting was used as a piece of evidence in the court case. 
Oh, really? But I have to say, it's more convincing than the other ones. Would that, yeah. would that have yeah. taken you in? Go on. Shame Put on aside you. your Shame professional you. pride. Come on, fess up. You've been in the forties yeah. and you'd seen that. Well, in the forties, I might well have actually doubted. My Many people pride. did. Many people believed this was uh, from here, and uh, the richest people in the world bought them. It became easier to understand how Van Meegeren duped the world's experts when Michel showed us the tricks of his trade. So these are all by Van Meegeren? All by Van Meegeren. And, and we can see uh, on, the, on the back that he used an old painting, an old 17th century yeah. painting, with patches and everything. The old goat. And would he have put these cracks in and this damage to the canvas? Yeah, he, he liked those things with the, because he knew that no painting would survive uh, the, the centuries without cracks. It's a bit like the cracking on someone's face. I mean, it's an indication of age. Sometimes it's the only evidence that one has that a picture is old. Yeah, here we can see that he also overcleaned his own work. Yes. Yeah, look at it's, this. That's As astonishing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. So what he did is he knackered his own pictures exactly. in order to give them the appearance yeah, yeah. of a picture that has come down through the ages and has been overcleaned at some yeah. point. I mean, this does, I mean, does look pretty realistic, doesn't it? I mean, to have this evidence of the process is such an insight, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, I begin to think we're not just dealing with an artistic mind, we're actually dealing with a sophisticated criminal mind, don't you think? Mm. I, mean, I also think, looking at these, these are like your dirty little secrets, aren't they? You, you have a past, though, don't you? Because you worked at the courthold, where I this did. picture is, that we're, we're, we're looking into. What's your view? It's hard to say, because I haven't uh, studied the painting close up, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's older than Van Meegen's time. So you don't think it's a so 20th century painting? No, I don't think so. It's, it's only on the basis of technical analysis that we will find out. But your hunch is that it's not a Van Meegen? OK, yeah. You want to you know, though, don't you? I want to know it. This, and, is, uh, this is important, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> I'm keen to learn more about the man who wreaked havoc in the art world. I've managed to track down the last person alive who knew Van Meegeren, his nephew, Pim Polman Town. Hello! Hi! Glad to meet you. Nice Please to meet come you. In. Thank you. Tell me about this photograph. Deze foto is genomen in het najaar van 1947. Kijk, dit is mijn oom en dit ben ik. Did you ever see your uncle paint? Ja. Ik heb mijn oom zien schilderen mijn eigen portret. Dit was in diezelfde tijd in het najaar. Dat ben ik so en dat heeft hij, Ja, en dat heeft hij in twee uur tijds heeft hij dat even op papier gezet. What do you remember of the trial and the whole scandal of it? Het was ontzettende hype van de media. Van de hele wereld kwamen ze naar Amsterdam toe om hem te interviewen, om tijdens het proces erbij te willen zijn. Want dat was de grootste vervalsing die ooit is, heeft plaatsgevonden. Omdat hij natuurlijk de hele wereld heeft hij eigenlijk op de kop gezet. En als u daar gaat dat hij gezegd heeft, als ze tien jaar na mijn dood het nog over mij hebben, dan heb ik wat betekend. We leven nu ruim 60 jaar na zijn dood en we hebben hier een interview over hem. What do you think he would think now, if he knew that even today his paintings are still causing arguments and disagreements? What would he think of all that? Hij zou er nog steeds van genieten. Hij genoot er toen van dat hij de, de befaamde kunstcritici kunst, uh, in de luren heeft gelegd. En dat zou hij nou nog steeds van genieten, daar ben ik van overtuigd. I have a picture here, where your uncle is still causing trouble. <laughs> Do you think your uncle painted this? Het zou mij ook weer niet verbazen, want ik denk dat er nog vele schilderijen over in de wereld zijn, die toch uit, van zijn hand afkomstig zijn en die voor origineel uitgegeven worden, dus het zou kunnen. So you mean you think there are paintings still out there in Holland around the world that are undiscovered forgeries by your uncle? Ik kan het niet bewijzen, maar ik zou mij zeker niet verbazen. Ik, ik, ik denk het wel. So your uncle might have the last laugh then? Oh yeah, absolute. Absolute, I'm sure. <laughs> 
Before I came here, I assumed that Van Meegelen was a kind of stain on the national honour of Holland. But actually, having met Van Meegelen's nephew, I can see that not only is he really rather proud of him, but it's also a bit more complex than that, because he's not the only one to be proud of Van Meegelen. They still, here in Holland, feel that, OK, he was a forger, but he was a, he was a really good forger, and they're, they're rather proud of that. I've been doing some digging, and I've been told that the Rice Museum Conservation Lab holds some vital evidence. This state-of-the-art facility is devoted to the scientific analysis and conservation of some of the world's most treasured works of art. In a corner of the studio is a cupboard full of the most fascinating collection of artefacts, all seized from Van Meegren's studio at the time of his arrest in 1945. Although this evidence was examined during Van Meegelen's trial, it has never undergone the scrutiny of modern forensic tests. Well, look, this one says Hans Van Meegelen, October 1945. So this is a kind of tag that was used in the trial. Yeah. This is one of his props, wasn't it, in his paintings? Must have been. Yeah, I mean, this, that's a 17th century piece of glass. You know, he went to infinite pains, this man, didn't he? Oh, this is a dream. Fantastic. Look at this. Now, these are all samples of the pigments that were discovered in his studio. So these are the, the pigments he used in his paintings, in his face? These are, the, these are the actual ingredients for his pictures. Wow, look at that. Cinnabar. Oh, look, lapis lazuli. What a gift, eh? I mean, I can't think of another comparison of an artist being able to be discovered or rediscovered so precisely in this way. Analyse these and we'll be able to find out exactly what was in his pictures and we'll be able to move forward. Before we returned home, I was shown one last piece of evidence that could help us date the Courtauld's painting. Several versions of the Procurus are known to exist. This is quite common for 17th century works of art, as paintings were often replicated or copied by apprentices who were learning their master's craft. One of these versions has hung in the Rijksmuseum since 1898. If Van Meegeren did forge the Courtauld's painting, he would have made his copy from this work, which is known to have been painted nearly 400 years ago by an apprentice of the old master, Dirk van Beburen. I asked Michel to take paint samples from this 17th century work to compare them to the Courtauld's Procurus. The flecks of paint are so tiny, it'll cause minimal damage. I also convinced him to make another hole, albeit a microscopic one, in their mutilated Van Meegren fake. Would the paint from the Courtauld's picture match up to the genuine work or the 20th century forgery? This is getting really exciting. I mean, this is real progress. And we've got the Rijksmuseum, the great institution, to allow us to remove, and it's happening now, two flecks of paint, two bits of paint from two of their works of art. I mean, it's quite a big ask. I mean, we are actually taking something off their paintings and taking it over the channel. Paint almost acts like uh, blood at a crime scene. I mean, as a result of analyzing the material, we can establish things that were never formally establishable. We can work out, for example, whether the painting could have been done at that date. If the pigment's not around then, it can't be. You know, we can establish sometimes what the actual artist used, whether the likelihood is that it was that artist because of what they used. All sorts of questions that the scientist, that the microscope, that the scalpel can now answer. So you're preparing here the samples of the Procurus from the Rijksmuseum and also Van Meegren. That's right. I'm doing the final polish and then they're ready to go to the Courtauld Institute. My hope is that these samples hold the answer to whether the Courtauld's painting is genuine or fake. How exciting. Thank you very okay. much. You're welcome.
We've left Amsterdam confident in the knowledge that we've gathered enough evidence to solve the mystery of the Courtauld's painting. While we've been away, Bendor has been studying documents relating to Van Meegeren's interrogation and trial. I've got here a copy of Van Meegeren's statement he made when he was arrested in 1945. It is, if you like, his, his confession where he admits to everything. And it contains a reference to the Courtauld's procurus. What, to our painting? Indeed. Good news. But don't get too excited because I've had the document translated and he says not that he painted a procurus, but that his former wife bought it in 1938. And he even says here, for about 600 francs in an antique shop in Nice. Well, well, there we are, aren't we? I mean, that's it. He didn't fake this painting. His wife bought it, and there it is, in black and white. You see, I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. This man was a liar. He lied in paint, he was a forger, and he twisted the truth as well. I think this picture is by Van Meegeren. I'm going to put my neck on. Yeah, but he confessed. Hang on a second, because he confessed to painting seven other fakes or seven fakes in court. Why would he not confess to this one? Doesn't make we, sense. We know he didn't confess to everything. I'll tell you why I think it's a Van Meegeren. Have a look at this. This is one of Vermeer's most famous pictures, the concert. You probably recognise it. You probably haven't looked that carefully at the background. Well, you may have done. Who knows? But have a look. What can you see? Oh, right. The Procurus. It's our picture, isn't it? Mm. Or it's the image. Mm. Take a look at the next picture. Again, a really famous work by Vermeer, Young Woman at the Virginals. But have a look at the painting in the background. Oh, yes. So it's, it's the Procurus again, yeah. Now, we know that Vermeer had a version of this picture in his studio. We know that Van Meegeren was obsessed by Vermeer. My theory is, and it's a circumstantial theory, but I think it's a strong one, I think that he was producing a prop to use in his fakes. Well, props like he had in the cupboard. Exactly, the ones we saw. Yes, I mean, we know that Van Meegeren had a whole range of props. Uh, perhaps the most famous was this little white jug that he used repeatedly in his fake Vermeers. Uh, in fact, this is fascinating footage from the, the auction of uh, Van Meegeren's studio effects uh, after the whole scam was exposed. And don't forget that Van Meegeren was wildly popular because he was a man who ripped off Goering. And as you can see from the audience, uh, there was great demand to have a little piece of Van Meegeren action. Amazing. Well, it's an interesting theory, and it's quite a seductive theory, but that's all it is. It's just a theory, it's just your hunch. We've got these samples. I'm going to go to the courthold. Let's see what they tell us. The more I learn about how ambitious Van Meegeren was in plotting his fakes, the more I wonder to what extent forgers are getting away with it today. The thing is, there have been forgers since time immemorial. And for sure, there will be forgers and fakers out there now who are conning people, conning experts, who knows? To find out more, I contact Scotland Yard. I'm instructed to travel to a secret store where the spoils of art crime are held. Head of the Art and Antique Squad, Detective Sergeant Vernon Rapley, agrees to show me the extent of the problem today. It's like Fort Knox in here. Now, even the location of this place is secret, so why all the secrecy about this building? Well, not only do we have our fakes and portraits here, but we've also got a lot of stolen artworks and artworks and antiquities recovered from all over the world um, that are very high, high value. So you don't want anyone to know where we are? Not really. <laughs> in here? In here. Wow. Look at this lot. So these are all fakes, are yes, they? Yes, they are, yeah. Wow. And what's happened to these paintings? How have you come by them all? Well, they've all been seized in the course of our investigations by the Art and Antiques Units. So this is what, a Banksy? Yeah, that's a, Banksy. That, that's a limited edition print by Banksy. That's something that we're having a great deal of problems with at the moment. Uh, very easy to, to uh, produce um, and also you have well, It's this, just a stencil, isn't it? Well, that is. It's just a stencil with a full signature applied. But they sell for quite quite a considerable amount of money. Like what? Well, a, a limited edition print line, that's probably 1500 £2,000 at least. 
um, and then a smaller, something like a stencil painting there, that can run into tens of thousands of pounds. Now looking at these, this is what a fake Lowry. Indeed. Um, there aren't old masters here as such. Is that because the old masters are much harder to do? What we're finding increasingly is that artists are preferring to go for more modern, contemporary uh, artworks. The checks that are done on them are not so exacting as, as you would if, for example, you were looking to buy a Vermeer, you would conduct every, every check. How many fakes and forgeries are out there in the art market at the moment? Some law enforcement agencies suggest 40 or 50 percent of the art market could be what, fakes and forgeries. Nearly half a market, yes. So, what does that say about the state of the art market? Or anyone who wants to go out and buy a painting, if nearly half of them could be fakes? That's astonishing. Well, there are, without any doubt at all, thousands of fakes out there. They are being produced on a daily basis by a number of artists, and people need to consider that uh, when, they're, when they're making purchases and to, to act more carefully. The thing that strikes me is that if up to half the paintings out there in the art market generally could be fake, there must be little time bombs planted in galleries and museums around the world, which in five, twenty, a hundred years' time, people will come to realise are not genuine works of art, but they are fakes and therefore valueless. And I'd quite like to learn a bit more about the people who are planting these little time bombs, these forges. Who are they? While Fiona hunts down today's forgers, I'm trying to nail one from the past. I'm at the courthold with the paint samples from the Rijksmuseum and the box of pigments that Van Meegeren used, eager to start scrutinising the evidence. Hi there. Hello. Aviva Bernstock, expert in the scientific study of paintings, has agreed to help me. Forgers are often caught by their careless use of modern materials, so in order to make sure his fakes weren't spotted by scientific tests, Van Meegeren used the techniques of a 17th century painter. By comparing the paint samples from the Rijksmuseum with the Courtauld's painting, we should be able to identify how the procuress was painted and with what. What can we deduce from what you're looking at now? Well, what I'm looking at under the microscope and what I've captured on the screen here are samples from the three different paintings that you've brought samples from. Uh, one is the Rijksmuseum 17th century Procurus. The second is the Rijksmuseum van Meegeren. And here is a sample from the Courtauld picture. So we've got all three lined up now. We're in a pretty strong position to then make some comparisons. Yes, we have the 17th century painting, which has a classical structure. The sort of technique you'd expect from a 17th century painter in Holland. Exactly. Right. The most important thing to look at uh, is the first two layers. The first reddish paint layer that was applied to smooth the canvas, to fill up the canvas weaves. And then a second grey layer, a mixture of black and white, mixed together to create the smooth painting grey surface that was very popular in the 17th century. Now let's have a look at the Van Meegeren from the Rijksmuseum. It's a similar technique. Closely similar technique. The only difference really is the thickness of the layers. Fascinating. OK, so we've got a 17th century version. We have got the Van Meegeren version showing similar technique. Now, let's compare it with the Courtauld version. This is our picture from the Courtauld, which you can see has a very similar structure, the red layer followed by the grey layer. Yeah. So what we know about Van Meegeren is that he aped as far as possible the exact techniques of the 17th century. So if this is Van Meegeren, this is exactly what you'd expect? It rules him in. It definitely rules him in. But the structure is one thing. What about the materials? Well, what you can see really is that the materials that have been used are all consistent with 17th century paintings. Um, mm. And we know that Van Meegeren was very meticulous about choosing 17th century materials or materials that could have been used then. Mm. Uh, but what's really striking is that the box of pigments that you gave me from the Rijksmuseum are closely similar in colour and tonality to some of these pigments that we're seeing in the Courtauld picture. You can tell that already, can you? They just seem compellingly similar. I can only tell so much from microscopy. What I need to do is more sophisticated analytical techniques. I feel we're making progress, but it's still frustrating. We know that the Procurus was painted in a 17th century technique using 17th century pigments. 
And we know that Van Meegeren painted in a 17th century technique and used those pigments. I mean, we actually have them here in this box, the actual pigments that he applied to his paintings. So that rules him in, but equally, it could be a 17th century picture. But there's one sample in here that's not a 17th century pigment, and it's marked artificial resin. Now, I have a hunch what this might be, but if we can analyze it and find out for certain, we can move forward. The cunning tricks of the forger's hand are intriguing enough, but I'm eager to get inside the forger's mind. John Myatt served four months in prison in 1998 for painting and selling hundreds of fakes. Today, he legally produces copies by declaring that he's the real artist. But back then, he wasn't so upfront, and Scotland Yard said he'd committed the biggest art fraud of the 20th century. What a glory, look at all these. And all these are done by you? Yeah, yeah. So this, this is in the manner of Monet. Yeah. What else have we got here? This? Well, that's some Monet, Monet Avenue of Flowers, another Monet down there. Wow. Now, what have we got across there? Miro. At the end there, we've got a couple of Henri Matisse, uh, Alberto Giacometti, and now this is another Monet, um, Nicholson. Just take me back to the beginning then. John, because you were, what, an art teacher? Originally I was an art teacher, and later on, about ten years after that, when, when um, I was looking after two youngsters... Your two children? Mm -hmm. My two children. When I was looking after them by myself, I had to stop my teaching job because I had to be with them. So I put an advert in Private Eye, Genuine Fakes, from £250. So you were offering to do fakes of paintings, but... but uh, being completely upfront about the fact oh, that they were, they were mm. fakes and these are the ones that you had done. Mm. How did that change? One of the customers just took one of my paintings into one of the auction houses and uh, they said, oh, we will put a reserve on that of £25,000. Now, he just paid me 250 quid for it. And he called me up and he said, you can either keep the 250 or I'll give you £12,500. What's it going to be? And... Um, I just said, yes, 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 let's do it. And then from that moment on, you were what, churning them out churning effectively? Churning them out, rolling away, yes. I probably turned out about 200 fakes over, over a six, seven year period. You, you know, you were committing fraud on a grand scale. Uh, Did that not trouble you? No. I remember thinking, well, you know, no one's being bashed over the head here. Everybody's still alive at the end of it. It's only painting. But people were losing a lot of money. Well, they? Well, I mean, did you... Yes. Well, paintings they bought that then turned out to be fakes, absolutely. Yes. I mean, it's not a victimless crime. Did you... Were you troubled by that? No. You weren't? No. Not until afterwards. Not until about halfway through. I started feeling rotten about who I was and what I was doing, but I didn't get to that place soon enough. I guess the money was too tempting. Yeah. How many of your fakes are still out there now? 120. 120. Now, why don't you go out and identify them? I know, I had that question before when I was... Well, it's an obvious question, isn't mm. it? I mean, you've put some fakes out there in the market. Only you really can identify them. Why don't you? I well, mean, if you're really penitent, that's what you do, shouldn't you? Know, supposing you'd paid £30,000, and I come along and say, I did that. Well, you know, you've just lost a whole mass of money. Do you regret what you did? Creating oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. You chose to fake the modern end of painting uh, because it was easy to recreate these. What's the hardest thing, in your view, about creating a forgery like Van Meegeren did? The major problem is using the right materials and materials that will withstand scientific analysis. And that was his major uh, achievement. Do you think you could do it? I... Uh, Recreate a 17th century Vermeer? Yes, I do. Very confident? I am very confident. Well, you know, I'm in my comfort zone. Well, John seems very confident, scarily confident, that he can reproduce a 17th century masterpiece using Van Meegeren's techniques. We shall see. I mean, the interesting thing is, we don't know exactly the precise details of what Van Meegeren did, and this is one way, hopefully, we're going to find out.
Van Meegeren managed to fool the experts by his painstaking use of 17th century materials. So I need to buy the authentic ingredients for John to paint our fake. I'm heading to one of the last surviving traditional pigment shops to meet Dr. David Cranswick, an expert in painting techniques. Hello. Hi there. Nice to meet you. Um, we've set ourselves a rather ambitious task of trying to recreate Vermeer's great masterpiece, The Girl with the Pearl Earring. What about that glorious blue in the scarf then? How do we recreate that? Well, that's just about one of the most precious of all the colours. That's lapis lazuli, which we have up here on the shelf. Um, it's made from the rock. This is a piece of lapis. It's a gorgeous blue, isn't it? Absolutely. Once the pigment is drawn out of the, the rock, washed and purified, then weight for weight, it's the same price as gold. Really? And what about her gorgeous red lips there? They would have been painted with vermilion, and it's made by mixing together mercury and sulphur. And if it's got mercury in it, it's presumably pretty dangerous stuff then? It is. You have to be very careful with it, yeah. What about the yellow in her scarf and in her clothing? Uh, lit in yellow, this one here, um, mixed with yellow ochre, it gives this very, very beautiful bright yellow colour, which he would have used. Here in the, in the material down below, we have orpiment, orpiment, made from arsenic. This is a sample of it, so I wouldn't touch it. This, um, is, this is what arsenic looks like? That is what arsenic looks like. So it's amazing just... that something so beautiful could be so deadly. Mm. The white of her pearl earring. Now that's a very ancient colour. They would get, firstly, stale urine. Um, it had to be stale, had didn't to it? be stale, absolutely. <laughs> the staler the better. Have a sheet of lead, bury the whole thing into a dung heap. In dung? Absolutely. It gets yeah. better. It gets better. <laughs> also, out of wee and poo, effectively, yep. and one of the most toxic substances, mm. lead, yep. comes this pristine white. In the 17th century, these vivid powders would have been transformed into paint by mixing them with oil. What we're looking for is, uh, in the end, the final result should be like butter at room temperature. It should be soft, shiny, glistening, but not runny at all. Can I have a go? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it feels lovely. We knew that Van Meegeren followed the same traditional methods to make his paint, but he added a special ingredient to the mix. He confessed to adding to his recipe something he called artificial resin. Basic tests undertaken during Van Meegeren's trial revealed what this resin was, but methods of identifying chemicals have moved on considerably in the last 60 years. Just to be sure, and with all the advances of modern science, we reanalyzed the sample. Now, do you remember those test tubes that we picked up in Amsterdam, those things that had been taken from Van Meegeren's studio? Well, one of them, if you recall, had written on it artificial resin. The one with the brown stuff in it? Absolutely. We've had it analyzed, and now I got the results. Bendel. Yes, the analysis confirms that Van Meegeren used to mix his paints with a special ingredient called phenol formaldehyde. Phenol what? Phenol formaldehyde is better known as Bakelite. Bakelite? Mm -hmm. So Van Meegeren used Bakelite? Yes. So the kind of stuff that was used, I don't know, for old radios and for hair yes. and that kind of thing? Yes, you could take your pick, really. We've got some um, particularly hideous-looking examples from the 1940s here. It was a type of resin that you could pour into a mould uh, for any shape that you like, and when it set, it was extremely hard. And it was that hardness that appeal to Van Meegeren. Traditional oil paint takes hundreds of years to dry sometimes. And in his day, in Van Meegeren's day, they used a test to establish whether the painting was completely hard, whether the paint had gone completely solid. And they'd use something like acetone, which I've got here. What, like nail varnish, you remember? Exactly. And they'd use that to see if a painting was genuinely old or, or, or a modern fake? Certainly. You're not seriously going to put nail varnish remover on that painting? I am. And it was very simple. If the paint is old, and I believe this to be old, at least 300 years old, nothing will come off onto the swab. If it's modern, there'll be pigment on this piece of cotton wool. Have a look. 
That's lucky. <laughs> yeah, well, it's clean. God. So Van Meegeren would put Bakelite in his paintings then, so that when someone put a swab over it, it wouldn't come off. It would be that hard that even something like this wouldn't remove it. Exactly. Bakelite was his unique fingerprint. So that means then that the Courtauld's Procurus, if it's by Van Meegeren, will have Bakelite in it. While Philip heads off to test the Courtauld painting for Bakelite, I have to try and find some to paint our fake with. But it turns out the chemical it's made from, phenol formaldehyde, is pretty hazardous stuff. Certainly not something that should be handled in an artist's studio like Van Meegeren did. But John has agreed to follow Van Meegeren's methods as closely as possible. And so we have to take precautions. It means he's going to have to paint our fake in a rather unconventional setting. The chemistry lab of Imperial College London. Hiya. You need these just to be in the room. There's a coat for you. Very attractive. And a coat for you. Head of department Tom Welton is on hand to ensure our safety. There you go. Have a look. Excellent. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm ready. So what are we dealing with here? So we're going to mix some phenol with some formaldehyde to make the bacon light. And what is it about these, either separately or together, that makes them so dangerous? You have to get kitted up like this. Well, they're not so ridiculously dangerous to us. You know, we're used to handling lots of far more toxic things than this. But both of these are cancer-causing agents. They're both toxic and they're both corrosive. So cancer is, of course, the thing that everybody gets really scared about. But actually, of these, the thing that I would be most worried about immediately is the corrosive nature. If you get these on your skin, it's likely to cause blistering and hurt. And it gets worse. All right. You listen <laughs> because, carefully, John, aren't you? Because the formaldehyde is volatile and we're going to heat it up, which means that we'll get gaseous formaldehyde. And so we need to protect ourselves from that as well. What, from which breathing that from in? breathing it in, yeah. And so that's why we're going to do it in a fume hood, which will take, the air will blow over it and it'll take all the fumes away. And so you can't expose yourself with them, and so actually you'll be all right. And so can I just ask you, because our, our Fager van Meegeren used these without any of these precautions. Yeah. And how dangerous would that have been? Um, well, given that he did it over years and years and years, it's almost certain it will have affected his health in some kind of way. Probably yeah. bad lungs, yeah. ulceration of the skin. We certainly died quite young. There you go. Late 50s. I've never had it so good. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be all right. We'll sort you out. You're really looking forward to it now, aren't you? Wow. <laughs> Well, shall we start our journey into the unknown? <laughs> That's a very good way of putting it. <laughs> Paint, phenol formaldehyde, canvas. Van Meegeren never revealed precisely how he mixed phenol formaldehyde with traditional pigments. But in later years, his son recalled seeing him loading his brush with paint and then dipping it into the toxic solution. Now, how does it feel? It feels as though it, lose, it leaves the brush um, very quickly. Oh, so you can't push it around the canvas Quite, as easily? That, exactly. You can't cover up the, uh, the canvas. So what are you trying to do first? Just sort of paint in the big blocks of colour? Exactly that. What I'm doing is what all 17th century painters would do, is to block the painting to actually get rid of this white and establish the basic shapes, the shape of the face, the yellow ochre down here, the blue here, and again, the slightly lighter colour. So this is how Vermeer would have done it and how Van Meegeren did it? Yes. You see, I can, I, it's coming, isn't it? I mean, it's... it's it is. There's something quite impressive about your kind of wacky-on technique, just, John. Yeah. So this is ultramarine blue extracted from the lapis lazuli, worth its weight in gold. Worth its weight in gold. Have you used it before? No. It's very hard to get hold of these days. I mean, when you think about the works that you did when you were faking painting yeah. all those years ago, and what you're doing now. No, I took, I mean, I took absolutely no 
I paid no regard to, to the authenticity of materials or of canvases or of anything. None. I mean, I painted with household emulsion paint, KY jelly, just, and yet they were still authenticated. Th this is interesting because we're actually using 17th century pigments and the whole thing is, is, is as authentic as we can do it under these strange circumstances. What's happening here? Do you see how this paint's clouding over? Look at that. It looks all sort of cloudy and as if it's coagulating. No, there is, no, there's something happening. It's kind of just doing strange things. Now. So you think that's the phenylformaldehyde that's making it look so weird? Can't be weird, anything else, can it? It's just something. It's a reaction. So what are you going to do about that then? <laughs> well, I've got another two or three days. To be fair to John, it took Van Meegeren four years of experiments to perfect his techniques. He never wrote down the exact proportions of his paint and phenol formaldehyde mix. The thing is, when I was standing next to John, I thought, oh, actually, even I could do that, sort of slap the paint on, and they looked a bit rubbish. But coming back here, it looks brilliant, actually. I can completely see what he's doing in the structure of the face, he's taking shape, and I think he might know what he's doing. The only thing is, this phenol formaldehyde is kind of messing things up a bit. You know, no one has done this since Van Meegeren. No one has tried this. This is a first. So will it work? I genuinely have no idea. At the Courthold Institute, analytical chemist Klaasjen Vandenberg has flown from Amsterdam to take samples from the Procurus to test for phenylformaldehyde. So we know that Van Meegeren used phenylformaldehyde, Bakelite, in its pictures. And if we can prove that there's that element in this picture, then we've got the best unequivocal proof that we need. That's absolutely right. What we have to do now is to be very careful just to take the top layer of paint or the top layers of paint because we think that Van Meegeren reused canvases. So we, the top layers are definitely going to be his paint and we hope or we think they might be bound in phenol formaldehyde resin. Because if you strike lower, you could go to an earlier, more honest, even 17th century layer, possibly. That's right. If he used, reused a canvas and scrubbed the top paint layers down, then those first layers will be typical of the 17th century. Uh -huh. In your mind, how crucial is this test? This is the absolute proof. This test will tell us for sure whether this is by Van Meegeren or not. You wouldn't have a hesitation? Not a hesitation. It hasn't been used by any other forger that we know of. Back at the lab, John is finding that forging an old master is no easy task. Van Meegeren's toxic mix of paint and phenol formaldehyde is proving tough to handle. John. Fiona. Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> well, it certainly looks like her. Yeah. The paint looks a bit... Yes. ...weird, doesn't The paint it? is very... The paint is... It's a bit like painting with ground-up cornflakes. And there's a whole area here where the paint's actually dropped off, and I've had to... It's oh, actually yes. dropped off. Yes, I can see these little gap in the skirt. How have you found it? Has it been frustrating, then? Very. Very. What's it make you think about Van Meegeren and the way he worked? And it was pretty clever stuff, wasn't it? It's enormously clever. It's very hard to understand that degree of um, c commitment to, to a, a, a strange process. It's something very well, to audible. go to such lengths yeah. to recreate yeah. something it, from the 17th century. Yeah. So, baking next, then. Baking next. And have you had a bit of a go to see how that works? We have. It's been a catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> I can hardly wait to see it. Van Meegeren's final and bizarre stage was to bake his fakes. Heat should cause the phenol formaldehyde to harden, giving the painting the texture and appearance of an old master. This, distressingly, is white paint. That's white paint? That's white paint. And baked you baked it, it and yeah. you got chocolate mousse. And we got chocolate mousse. <laughs> okay. chocolate I, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's very worrying. Well. The moment has come. Should we, uh, should we put her in the oven? How long are we going to leave her in here for? Two hours at 110. Who knows what we'll find <laughs> when we come back.
it's going to be an agonizing wait. As John's test samples have shown, if we get the temperature or the timing wrong, our fake might be ruined. It could come out a complete charred mess. It could actually burst into flames uh, in that oven. So um, hmm, it would be a real shame after all this effort. Um, well, we can only wait and see, really, see what happens. I'm also waiting anxiously while the Cotel painting is undergoing its final, crucial test. The job requires a state-of-the-art machine, which the Courtauld isn't equipped with. So the samples were sent to the lab in Amsterdam, where Klassian got to work. Under intense heat, the paint sample breaks down into its component chemicals to reveal whether Van Meegeren's unique ingredient, phenylformaldehyde, is present in the Courtauld's painting. But what has a spell in the oven done to John's painting? Have we overcooked our fake? Ta da! It looks pretty good, doesn't actually, it? Actually, it's smoothed out, hasn't it? So we've really learned something from this. We have, haven't we? Actually, oh. because when we put it in the oven, it looks, you know, it's, you know, in the nicest possible way, a bit ropey. Yeah. And, and it has vastly improved with two hours in the oven. Right, so what do we do next? Well, I think we try and get some cracking. Van Meegeren would age his fakes by causing the paint surface to crack. But when we try it, things start to go badly wrong. Oh no! Oh, cut. It's cracking here, Nick. The only thing is it's cracking oh, and it's there actually... Oh, she goes. Look. It's coming off. It's coming off. That would lift off now. Hang on! <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh, cutting. Oh no! Look, it's oh. Well, I think we've taken this lady as far as we can go, really. Probably a bit too far. Yes, it's rather sad, yeah. isn't it? This. Mm. I think Van Meegeren has trounced us. Yes. He got over the final hurdle, and we didn't quite get there. Yes. Hi, Philip. Hey. I have here our attempt at reproducing <laughs> Van Meegeren's techniques. What do you think? It's, well, uh, I'd say it's sort of convincingly knackered. It is. Now watch this as well. What do you mean? Don't do that! I know, but that's the thing. You know, we baked it <laughs> and bits started falling off. I mean, it's not a bad attempt, but I have to say I wouldn't have taken it. Are you? Well, no, obviously, because it's falling <laughs> apart. At last it's here. News from the lab in Amsterdam. We shall find out once and for all whether Van Meegeren painted the Procurus. Hi, Klassian. Klassian, hi. Hi. Now, what have you discovered? Well, a team has done the analysis of the sample that I took from the Procurus at the Courtauld. And the result um, is that the painting was painted with phenyl formaldehyde resin which is very similar to Bakelite. Oh, that's it! That's what, that is it. that's what we're looking for. So we know definitely... Cause that's brilliant. We know definitely that the Procurus was painted by Van Meegeren because it has Bakelite in it. That is correct, yes. So it's as black and white as that. It is Van Meegeren. It can only be by Van Meegeren. Yes, because this is a modern synthetic resin which was only invented in the 20th century. And Van Meegre was the only artist, to our uh, knowledge, who has been using this uh, material. Fantastic! Yeah. That's that I mean, but uh, this, this is going to be so interesting from the point of view of not only the Courtauld Institute, but the Rijksmuseum. We've added another picture to the famous Faker's Earth. So how do you feel about that? Well, I'm uh, as excited as you are. <laughs> it's really a, a nice find. It's, uh, uh, I wouldn't have expected it myself. But there it is. Also, some of the most prominent experts in this country have kind of... Speculated that this is a 17th century picture. Absolutely. And it's made with Bakelite. And here we are, <laughs> and we've cracked it. Fantastic. It was with great delight that I called Aviva at the Courtauld Institute, finally to reveal the news. All our hard work has paid off, and this long, overlooked painting is now going to be proudly displayed in the Courtauld's Old Master Gallery.
as part of a special exhibition. Hi there. Hello. Hi, Viva. How are you? Very well. Well. Ta da Gosh, how amazing to see it here in the Courtauld. Yes, it's, it's great to see it here. I mean, there can't be many examples of where you get such a clear attribution as this. I mean, there's just no doubt. I don't think I've ever seen such an unequivocal result. This is absolutely and clearly Van Meegeren. Do you feel differently about it? <laughs> yes, it does make you think differently. It makes you feel more sure about its place in history. What are you going to do with it? It'll be very useful for the future for teaching and we're going to use it to show students uh, about a case that's so clearly and distinctively uh, a forgery. I think Van Megan would have rather liked this. Here he is hanging amongst all these old masters. Yeah, it's probably not quite what he imagined being hung as a forgery. But, you know, he's in one of the most august art institutions in the world. And he'll be studied by generations to come. <laughs>